Hi, thank you. I'm Pete Stevens, and yeah, as noted, Mythic Beast is a little bit smaller than AWS. So, uh, IPv6 hosting part two, or dual stack is rubbish. So, does that do anything? Previously, uh, here. Uh, running v6 only uh, virtual servers is something we started 2014. Um, nobody bought them because they weren't any good. Um, it turns out people do need to get to v4 resources. So uh, we came across some ideas that you've just seen repeated in the previous talk. Um, so, um, oh, hang on. Right, yes, so we have NAT64 and DNS64 configured by default, so any v6 only person can get out. Um, we have HA proxy configured inbound with a v4 address that you can tell it to forward traffic onto you that does um, SSL, HTTP, and a couple of other SSL things. All your VMs get a slash 64 of one address allocated, some more you can have. If you've paid extra, you can have a v4 address, um, and that's basically the, the setup of the VMs. Um, and dual stack is rubbish, basically. Uh, you can run IPv4 and IPv6 on the, on the same host. Um, it's cheaper to be IPv6 only because we will bill you for every v4 address you use. All of our management tools uh, are v6 only and can support that. So you can either run dual stack or you can not, uh, which is cheaper and uh, reduces the amount of time you spend configuring things like firewalls and so on. So um, when you move v6 only, um, this is not a universal solution. Some things don't work at all, really. Um, email. Do not try and host email on a v6 only server. Um, there are far too many uh, SMTP servers out there that are v4 only. Um, you can forward inbound through another MX provider, but if you do that, you lose the ability to reject at SMTP time. That's really annoying. Um, when you send all of your traffic outbound, they all go out through the NAT64 servers, which means you're sharing your outbound address with a lot of other people, and uh, reputation is a thing, so that doesn't work. Um, FTP doesn't work. Hooray! <laughs> um, Hadoop. Um, yeah, it's not the only one. There's a few other applications, but Hadoop is one that, yeah, it, it really doesn't work v6 only, and um, it's too painful and too hard to make go. So um, just resign and use v4 if you really have to. Um, things that don't work very well. Uh, Node.js, we'll come back to this one, because this one's quite popular. Um, basically, it really likes using v4. Um, Docker, um, Docker believes in NAT in a way that's like fundamentally embedded that's very hard to do. So um, it has improved. It used to be the case that you got a private IP address and the way uh, resolution was done by, was by rewriting the host file inside every other container in your entire network. It has moved on since 1990 um, and uh, it now can support v6. Um, you can even get it to hand v6 addresses out to containers, but all of the automatic firewalling and everything doesn't work, and developers get absolutely mad when they discover that as soon as they fire something up, it's now globally accessible. Um, Snap, containering um, applications as containers on Ubuntu, again, that really likes to do v4. And there's a general thing that there's a lot of applications that will prefer v4 if it's available, and their definition of available is much wider than actually being available. Um, so you have to really comprehensively break v4 to persuade some of these applications to use v6. So early on, things that we got wrong. Initially, uh, we gave a slash 64 out on each one of the lands in each one of our data centers, and we gave our customers a slash 96, which seemed a lot of address space each. Um, that, that worked very well until people started realizing that block lists should be based on slash 64s because that's people, what people have at home and one person sends spam and your entire data center gets blacklisted. Um, that, that didn't go well. So now we give people 64s on machines. You get a 48 per customer that you pull your 64s out of. Um, various people had to be renumbered. Um, that was no fun. Um, filtering. Um, this is one of the challenges. So when you're on a v6 only server, the whole of v4 appears to come from a single IPv6 address, um, which is not as much of a problem today as it used to be, because now the best part of half of your traffic might come in direct, whereas it used to be a tiny fraction. Um, and that means if you run any kind of uh, blacklisting, like anti-DDoS service or anything that says, oh, here's abusive traffic coming in, let's block the source address, it blocks the whole of the v4 internet. Um, 
which can have bonuses. But in general, yeah, you can't selectively block a view CV4 addresses in your firewall. So for web applications, we tend to use proxy protocol, which means that um, the web server knows the IP, but the system itself doesn't, which means that you can block selectively on your web server based on the source IP address. But that happens after SSL negotiation, which is an expensive step. So that's a problem that we would like to have fixed. And um, we have a proof of concept that we really need to do some more work on, where basically our inbound proxy um, maps the source v4 address into a unique v6 address. So therefore, you allocate a slash 96 to your, your proxy, and you get a different connection in from every v4 address. So you can then selectively firewall individual v4 addresses that are coming through your proxy. Um, we really need to embed this into HO proxy and make it production stable and all those things that we haven't yet done. But um, if anyone wants to do that, please go ahead. Um, otherwise, we might get around to it at some point. So some more things that went badly. Um, large on link prefixes. Um, if you give every customer a slash 64, they might use a different IP address for every single outbound connection that they make, which if they've decided what they're going to do is use their v6 address to aggressively span large social networks and send as many connections as they can gets really exciting. So you might see 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 new v6 addresses per second appearing on your LAN um, as they're going outbound. And you, of course, have to do neighbor discovery in order to send the packets back to them. Um, which gets um, very fun. Um, also, you get people who randomly scan your v6 address and send millions and millions of packets. So um, you spend a lot of time doing neighbor discovery, um, which basically comes down to the fact that your router does not fit a slash 64 of v6 address to MAC address mappings in it. Um, so RAM exhaustion, garbage collection, you can stall the network, all kinds of things can happen. Um, we've got a lot of Linux routing. Uh, in Linux, you can stall the entire network stack for v v6 neighbor um, table garbage collection. And you can get this into tens of milliseconds, which gives lovely little spikes on your graph. Um, and anyone who's in the same layer 2 domain as you can force you to do this all the time. So basically, yeah, neighbor, neighbor discovery is, is, is pretty painful um, because of the size of the address space and keeping it all in RAM. Which leads to the question of why do we do neighbor discovery in ARP? And this is to match IP addresses to MAC addresses. And our billing database already knows where they all are. Because fundamentally, if you're buying the service from us, we know what service you bought, where it is, and what MAC address you have. Um, so from a security point of view, if you give us an answer that doesn't match our billing database, we could just throw it away. So why do we do this? So you can turn it off. So our switches just have a static config that says, I've got a v6 address, and the neighbor is over there. And we can read your, so we do this for link local addresses. So we know where your link local address is. We know what MAC address it's on. And then we can read your entire slash 64 to your link local address. And then we don't need to do neighbor discovery at all. And you can do the same thing with ARP for v4, um, although that's less of a problem. And then we've got a BGP daemon running on the switch. So when the link comes up and it knows it's got a link local address that it can talk to, it can then advertise the v6 address range out to the rest of our network and all the routing flows. Um, and that solves a fair few problems. And um, this gives you portability across everywhere, because everything is now BGP and layer 3. And absolutely everything looks like a point to point, and you no longer have any shared layer 2, which is really nice. Um, unfortunately, we haven't finished rolling out yet. We're kind of two out of five data centers, and we're working on the rest. But that is the eventual aim. So that's, that's the direction we're going in. Um, and uh, we will eventually get there, but it's taking some time. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of basic design. The question is, how are we getting on? So we've got a big graph um, of people who are single stack, people who are dual stack, and people who are single stack being the better kind of single stack than the rubbish kind of single stack. Um, so this is customers where Mythic Beasts are managing them. So we have a login on the box, and we are in some way responsible for keeping it secure and working. We've got another load of customers who are unmanaged. Their stats do not look anywhere near as good as this. Um, however, that's kind of a bit of a lie. It's not quite as good as that. Um, the V6 only applications tend to be simpler and easier to manage, and they tend to be newer. Um, and because IP addresses cost money, people are prepared to break services up into more machines with V6 than they are with V4, because they're not trying to save 
money on address space. So the V4 ones tend to be harder and more complicated or single machines running more services and so on. Um, and so retiring legacy things is hard. We're slowly getting rid of them. And uh, this slide is actually taken from the IETF two weeks ago. So another 3% is due to go by the end of this month. It's actually gone. I turned them off. A V4 only system built with CentOS 5 in 2017 after the end of life of CentOS 5 for a six month migration plan that we've turned off in November 22. <laughs> Turning legacy things off is really hard. IPv flag day in 2030 is very optimistic. 2130, not betting on that one happening. Doing this, I also found we've got some public services that it turns out are still v4 only that we've never enabled v6 on that we haven't noticed. Mostly they're some serial servers for getting out of band access to your servers. We still need to fix that. I need to write more tickets and kick people until they all get done. Um, this is possibly an unpopular point in this room, but v4 is always going to be here. Some things are too hard and too expensive to migrate to v6. And we recently did a new v4 only setup on behalf of a bank. Um, we charge them extra for v4, um, and they're a bank. So they're not going to run out of money, because they're a bank. Uh, we charge them two pounds an IP address. If it had been $100 a month for the IP, that would have been fine, because they're a bank. Um, so um, quick interlude from Finance Land. I'm not a financial advisor. Do not take investment advice off me, OK? But here's some things that might panic your finance director. Uh, we started v6 only in 2014. We set the price of a v4 address at two pounds a month because it seemed like a cheap enough amount that it wouldn't stop people actually buying services from us, but expensive enough that it might annoy people into stopping using it. And this appears to be an industry standard because uh, there's a load of other people who charge for IP addresses now, um, and they all charge somewhere around about two pounds a month. Um, the interesting one is Zen Internet on the bottom. It turns out retail IPs for um, broadband uh, are valued much lower than they are in service provider land, um, which is probably a clue that um, retail is going to run out of v4 and turn them all off first, um, as a number of people in this room have already done. So um, here's a question. Suppose you ran a pension fund and you needed a steady income to pay for your pension as being retired. At the moment, you buy 10-year government bonds that return 3.5%, whereas you could buy $50 IP addresses that return 48%. <laughs> and if they cost $500, they'd still return 4.8%, which looks pretty good compared to government bonds. That's a question for your finance director. Right? How high can the price of an IPv4 address go? If you take Amazon's $3.60 price, it's even better, right? So, um, yeah, which is the next question. Do you need to worry about asset stripping? This got really popular in the 80s with pension funds in exactly the opposite way. Um, there's a fictional tier one ISP that's definitely not related to a real one. Um, it has an enterprise value, which is a financial construct, which is the value of all of its shares, plus all the money it's borrowed over of other people that it needs to give back. Um, if you do that, um, you get a value of about $3 billion, and it's got 30 million IPv4 addresses, um, which is about $100 an IP address. So um, half the value of that company is IP space. If the retail value of an IP address hits $100, you can buy its IP space at the current market rate and get a free tier one thrown in. Um, which leads you to this guy in this film back in the 80s who bought an airline and shot it in order to take the money out of the pension fund. So um, at what point does that happen to the company you work for? And how, how much do you need to panic that someone buy you, shut you, and sell, you for the, IP and sell the IPs? Um, so yes, anyway, as I said, don't take financial advice from me. Um, now, a slide from my friend uh, Eben. He makes computers that cost $5. IP addresses, since the first time I gave this talk, have gone up quite a lot. And since I made this talk, quite a lot more computers have come out of the computer factory, and no IP addresses have come out of the IP address factory. Um, that's probably going to carry on into the future. Now, the problem with that particular computer is it doesn't have an Ethernet socket, so it's not actually very useful for what I want to do. I have to use a much more expensive computer. I have to use this one. This one costs about $55, which is approximately the price of an IP address. Um, that is a box that's absolutely rammed full of Raspberry Pis. 
um, when you start putting it all together, you get a little set of fans and a switch and so on, and you end up with 96 Raspberry Pi 4s in 3U of rack space. Um, they've each got 8 gig of RAM, they're each a quad-core machine. So they're not completely slow, but they're, they're not a modern Intel machine. But there's 96 of them, right? So this is what we built to be our Raspberry Pi cloud. Um, and uh, you bolt the whole thing together. Sadly, there is a slash 30 or RSC1918 space attached to each one in order that it can netboot because the netboot loader doesn't fully support V6. Um, but basically, we can't afford to give them a public V4 address each because that's crazy. Um, the V4 address is the same price as the computer. Um, so all external communication is IPv6. Consequence of that, you do lose some customers. Some people say, I bought this, it doesn't have V4, it's rubbish, can I have my money back? And the answer is, like, well, I suppose so, go on then. Um, and you get odd, requ odd requ requests for, can you proxy odd things for me, which is, can you virtually give me a V4 address in some way? Um, but fundamentally, there's still a lot of these things, and a lot of people have discovered you can, in fact, work in a V6-only environment, which looks exactly like our VM-based um, V6-only environment. Um, you have excellent security education. I did another one of these tickets this morning. Um, a lot of people uh, install a really good firewall to protect their server from all the bad things on the internet that can't talk to them because there's no IPv4. Um, your firewall can protect you from your file system. Um, so you can firewall out your file system, and that ends about as well as you expect. Um, so yes, so that's how the Pi Cloud is built. So running applications, v6 only, um, et cetera, host workarounds. We do a few of these. So this works pretty well on node.js. Um, if you put a v6 address into et cetera hosts, when it does its lookup, it doesn't get an A record back. Because uh, it doesn't get an A record, it will then try and connect over v6. Whereas if it sees an A record, it will always connect over v4, even if it can't. Um, so that's a like hideous workaround that only works for things that don't change their IP address very often. Um, but yeah, it's very frustrating, basically. Um, you've got uh, NPM itself, the Node Package Manager, has dual stack, and it still won't download data over v6 on a dual stack machine. And on a single stack v6 machine, it just doesn't bother downloading data at all, even though it's got a dual stack source, which is kind of frustrating. So there's a bunch more workarounds we kind of need to look at a bit further. Um, so one non-standards compliant thing is should our DNS64 servers just drop A records entirely and pretend that only v6 addresses uh, exist, um, which is a thought. Um, we've used TNAP64, which is a, a library that runs on Linux where um, if anything tries to connect to a v4 literal, it intercepts it, works out what the synthesized v6 address would be and connects to that instead. Um, that doesn't always work very well with localhost 127.001. Um, yeah, attempting to get things to connect to colon colon 1 it can be tricky. Um, I think I'm prepared to allow machines to keep 127.001. It's probably OK. Um, we also have used CLATD, um, which works pretty nicely. So it synthesizes an interface on your machine, uh, uses a default route for v4, and then spits everything out through your NAT64 server. Um, but that's not actually packaged for common Linux. It'd be really nice if that was packaged for every common Linux installed by default and automatically switched on on every machine in the entire world. If, if, you know, if we could do something to make things better, that would be really good. Um, so um, is all this stuff just a toy, particularly our Raspberry Pi stuff, right? Um, well, actually, no. There's 25 million Raspberry Pis in industrial applications in the world. And a lot of those people who build those want to have test environments, and they like cloud test environments rather than having it on Bob's desk, because Bob has coffee, and coffee and Raspberry Pis mix badly. So, um, so we've had some private clouds. Um, we've had universities who've spun it up for classes and so on. Um, distributed uh, system research is kind of fun because it's not virtualized. All these things are real. Um, you know, you're not actually running five VMs that are secretly the same same real machine. Um, and to pick one fun example, this is Pi Wales. Um, there's a lot of in, uh, Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station um, because they sent them up to educate kids. And once you've certified a Raspberry Pi with a camera on it for educating kids, and you then want to send a different video camera up to the space station, it's cheaper to use the one you've already certified. So they keep sending more of them up, 
because they're certified for use on the International Space Station. However, one of the things the kids want to do with their experiments is they want to do numerical computation, which involves NumPy, numerical Python, and that takes two and a half hours to compile on the original Raspberry Pi, which is the one they sent up first. So they thought, we should pre-compile that and ship up a binary. And the guy who did that said, yeah, but there's lots of other Python modules they might want. Why don't we compile all of them? And so he said, let's compile every Python module for every Python version for the Raspberry Pi. Worked out that his Raspberry Pi wasn't fast enough and found someone who owned a Raspberry Pi cloud and did it there. And so he obviously put the entire website to run this on the Raspberry Pi as well, which sits on our, behind our proxies. And he has millions of downloads per day of binaries that are being continually streamed out of this for people supporting all kinds of applications. Um, which is which is fun, and that definitely looks like a real user because those are some good numbers. Um, we also support Raspberry Pi desktop in our cloud, so you can rent a Raspberry Pi desktop for testing your application out, and that means we've got a whole load of users who are running in a NAT64 environment and don't know because they've just rented a thing with the desktop and the internet kind of works and you get websites and so on. Um, and what became kind of exciting uh, when we were getting this ready was uh, there's an application called Mastodon. Has anyone heard of it? That's different to two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, occasionally, if you run a social network, watch out for guys carrying sinks, right? So Mastodon's a decentralized social network um, where basically uh, you have a server, you post little blogging things, a bit like a website that allows very short blog posts only. Um, and all these uh, servers all talk to each other in order to work out who posted what, who liked what, who wants to read, read what off who. Um, and every one of these things needs to talk to every other one. And um, this became popular with some relatively famous people, uh, which has driven some load relatively quickly, um, and made um, it stop being a thing for weird nerds and became a thing for people who know weird nerds. Um, and so <laughs> in the two weeks since I gave this last time, it was 4,000 servers, it's now 8,000 servers, and they all need to talk to each other, which means they all need v4. Except that they don't, because if you've got v6 only Mastodon server, our inbound proxy for v4 on our outbound NAT6 works absolutely fine since the release of 4.0.2, which was about a week ago. Because two weeks ago, when I gave this talk last time, we ran 3.5.2, and that didn't work at all because it used v4 for every outbound connection, so we had to install CLATD. But fortunately, the open source community is full of nice people, and they fixed all of the bugs in seven days after I whinged about them, and the new stable release is fine. So that's all great. So, um, so yes, and uh, there was some. This guy called Alistair. He's one of the uh, technical writers for Raspberry Pi, and he uh, kicked us onto this by saying, "I want to launch Mastodon today, uh, and I want to host it on a Raspberry Pi, please." Uh, which is one of the motivations for getting all of those V4 bugs fixed. So their instance is running on a Raspberry Pi in our cloud. Um, which now has tens of tens of 20,000 followers, 30,000 followers. A lot more than that. That slide's old. Um, but yeah, so it's all running on a Pi. It's completely v6 only, and that is production stable. v6 only talks to a massive decentralized network of v4 only people. Um, so Mythic Beasts, R1 is v6 only, obviously. Uh, and it's direct, fully bi-directional interoperability. Um, you can self-host it down at the five, eight, ten pounds a month kind of region. At which point, your two pound a month for a V4 address starts to look really significant for people who are hosting their own one. And the thing about technical people is a lot of them are really tight when it comes to paying for services on the internet. Like they will shave off that 50p no matter if they have to spend all night recompiling FreeBSD. All right. <laughs> And from our point of view, the nice thing for us is we don't care that the rest of the world has not yet deployed v6. I have another service that runs in a v6-only environment that I can sell, and I am not constrained by the availability of v4, so my business can keep expanding, which is the thing I want to do. So, um, and you know, my previous talk here has covered a whole load of other applications like WordPress and all sorts of other things that we've run on exactly the same basis. But yeah, it's another one, and it's a nice example. So that is a brief update on where we are. And after that, we have a blog where you can see things. We've got a weird Mastodon address, which is the one you've probably not recognized before. And you can even go to a website run by a guy who launches rockets, which may occasionally contain things. Um, so other than that, has anyone got any questions?
Oh, I've got off. I'm lightly. here with the box. <laughs> Gonna have fun. Oh, Tom. Oh Tom, dear. Like, okay. Anyone else before Tom? <laughs> 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 okay. Well, Chris. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. um, are you finding the cost of power is having any kind of impact on your business right now? The cost of power? Yeah. That is quite significant, yeah. Um, data centres send you nice letters roughly every day saying you need to give us more money. Um, so, yeah, if you could build servers that don't consume electricity, that would be even better than servers that don't consume V4 addresses. <laughs> um, but I think um. physics says no. <laughs> I was just going to make the observation, it's Tom from BT, um, that when we start talking about turning off IPv4, it has helped you, I think, I think from the, the slide that was quite a long way back, it actually helped you, you know, sit down and think, have I actually enabled IPv6 on these services yet? And oh. it, was, it was quite interesting to note, really, that, you know, just, just the mere the sheer thought of, have I checked my homework, was, uh, you know, incredibly valid, and, and talking about turning off v4 just uncovers all of these stones, and I'm, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to make the observation, really, more than anything. I don't think anybody's dual stack service actually works v6 only, unless they've tried it. Yeah. And to give you a case in point, earlier on today, someone mentioned the IPv6 Flag Day website, which embeds an image which is only accessible over v4. But now we can talk about that and they can go and fix it. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yes, exactly. So, I mean, my, my target is, is not quite as aggressive as that. I think everything should work from the point of view of um, being sat behind a NAT64 server to give you your outbound. Um, because um, we are not going to turn off v4 entirely. There is somebody who has an application that they cannot move. And they will always be there. And um, uh, fundamentally, you are going to have to have a compatibility, le compatibility layer to get to them. And you know, let's face it, banks haven't turned off COBOL yet. I don't know if uh, COBOL for banks has an adequate V6 implementation. And I don't know who's going to implement that, because the people who know V6 well generally are a bit rubbish at COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my point is, we, we, we might see these as lofty goals, but when we start talking about them, and when we start doing things like running NAT64 Wi-Fi at big internet conferences, meetings, um, we get people to realize shit's broke, and they yeah. need to fix it. And yeah, as you, you found a couple of services that weren't dual stacked, and you went and fixed them. It was brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, the, the NAT64 at, at internet conference Wi-Fi is, is a great starting point, because that actually lets people discover that this thing really doesn't work, this application doesn't work. Um, and you know, it, it, was, it took us a long time when we made our management support V6 only servers to find the very last things that we hadn't quite thought about, down to you know, things that automatically write config that draw graphs. We assumed things had a V4 address because it put a space in for this is your V4 traffic. Like, what if we don't need that? And so there's, yeah, there's definitely a, a hard bit of picking off what are the V4-only assumptions you've made. Um, and we still, we still have a sum. So um, for people um, co-locating servers to us, we assume they get a V4 address still, because no one yet has decided to colo a completely V6-only environment. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we've provided them ourselves on our own servers, but we still make an assumption that if someone is going to ship a servers, they're going to have a V4 address attached to it, because everyone currently wants that. And you know that's a bug that we are going to need to resolve, and it won't be difficult to resolve. We just haven't done it yet. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So we are quite tight on time cool. because Pete then uh, he participates also in the panel, and I know then he's got a hard cut off. He needs to catch a train. But Pete, I also want to thank you very much for hosting our website. Oh, thanks no to problem. Matic Beasts and Pete, we are on IPv6 only. Yet you can access us from the old world too. You know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pete. Yeah.